Good morning, I'm Henry Trix from The Economist, um, and I want to welcome you all here this morning. It's great to see so many of you here. Thanks very much indeed for coming. We called this event the New Oil Order. We should probably have called it the New World Order. Not since the fall of the Berlin Wall has there been a news event quite as momentous as, uh, as the uh, election of Donald Trump as President of the United States. It occurs just as the world's energy markets are also in a state of unprecedented flux. 25% of the warming that our planet is experiencing right now is associated with methane emissions. And the oil and gas industry is a large industrial source of those emissions. We understand now that these emissions exist not just in the United States, but they exist globally. Um, the, the magnitude of the emissions, well, we have some rough estimates, and there's clearly room for doing the kind of science-based research that we did in the United States, doing it globally, and we're very pleased uh, that, uh, that any in BP are working with us to do that kind of uh, rigorous science-based analysis globally. If you look at the worldwide, there is no policy except in the US, Canada, and, and Mexico where they put a, a, a limit, a target, uh, President Obama, of 45% reduction by 2025, I remember well. So I think that also the policymaker must play a strong role. We are now operating in a regulatory framework in the world that says by the second half of this century, we will have to have moved to a net zero carbon economy. And you then had to look within the UK and say, well, how are we going to achieve that? And you've got a report like the Cambridge Econometrics report that is saying if we, if we do what we need to do on our domestic efficiency, our heating, our domestic heating and so on, um, actually there will be 26% less gas being used by 2030 in the UK. The energy transition in Germany had already begun to bite. I hope this isn't an unfair question, but if you look at the oil and gas companies around now, how would you recommend to get ahead of this kind of disruption? On one hand, there is the unreversible trend to decarbonisation, and I don't think that one single American, even if he becomes president, really makes the difference. You know, that is a trend which is globally irreversible. And it's a matter of speed, how quick the United States, you know, stay attuned with that or not. Uh, if they don't, then probably Germany and China are going to lead the pack on this one and America is going to be left behind. So that trend is there and will continue. But at the same time, we see that the conventional generation has a bridging role to play. And that bridge is going to be a pretty long bridge and a pretty broad bridge. This goes right to the heart of natural gas's value proposition as a lower carbon alternative to coal and oil. Uh, and so it's incredibly important that we get a handle on this because there are real questions as to the benefits of natural gas as a low carbon alternative if we can't get a handle on these emissions and take steps to reduce them. The big takeaway from today um, quite, uh, quite interesting and, uh, to see how much attention was put on the falling price of renewables. Now gas maintains uh, very much this, um, this, this image as the, the bridging fuel to the future. In one sort of closing hat tip, if you like, to our main sponsors, the Environmental Defence Fund, one has to remember that natural gas has a methane problem, there does seem to be effort by the industry to do something about it. EDF is working very hard to help them do that, but more measurement would um, also be good.